Hello, I'm Sean Lim and welcome to After 10. Sports and peace, what's the connection? And in particular, can football resolve misunderstanding and conflict around the world? Well, tonight on After 10, we meet one man who has a mission to create peace through sports. Stay with us. Last Saturday, we went to a children's football program that on the surface looks like any other program, but in actuality, it's anything but ordinary. English coach Dan Gudgeon. Why is this program so special? Rather than physical training, this program focuses on peace education. <laughs> he majored in the Department of Peace Studies. Dan Gudgeon also wrote a master's thesis on the Korean Peninsula. Qualified by the Football Association, he became a certified football coach. Currently, he's working as a sports manager for the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic Organizing Committee. He says, as you gain a better understanding of peace education, you can understand why football is the answer. We will now hear more on the connection between sports and peace back in the studio. Well, thanks so much for coming in to speak with us tonight on sports and diplomacy. Mm, thank you for having me. Well, sports and peace. Uh, you know, normally we don't really connect the two. In fact, diehard sports fans can usually uh, foster a lot of conflict with other <laughs> opposing teammates. Uh, what, what does it mean to you when we say we're going to foster peace through sports? Okay, well, first of all, I agree with you that sport can create very heated uh, arguments and discord, but uh, we think that it can also be used to create peace. And you have to think that the way that we look at it is that peace is not a, a condition that can just be, that just exists after two leaders sign a peace treaty. It is actually much more something that needs to be cultivated and built through people's attitudes and the way that they, uh, the way that they look at each other. And we think that certain attitudes that are necessary for peace can also be developed through playing uh, team sports. We have to think as well that children are the future conflict instigators or conflict resolvers in, the, in 20 or 30 years. So what we do with them here hopefully will influence them in, in the future. Well, speaking of children, you're here in Korea and you've started a children's youth program that brings uh, the sport of soccer or football into children's lives to create some sort of uh, peace-building skills. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, what we have is a program which is based on four principles that we're trying to install in, instill into the children. And these are uh, respect, equity, uh, trust and responsibility and we believe that if children are installed with these skills then they can learn to resolve conflicts themselves in a productive manner. Uh, so with our program it's broken into four sections. We have a warm-up where we will introduce the themes that we want the children to think about during the day. That could be respect, for example, respecting a referee's decision, it could be trust, for example, trusting your teammates with that really precious ball. It could be uh, many, many different things. And then we have a technical phase where the children learn new skills. And then we have a game situation. And in that game situation, we are trying to pick out something, uh, what we've called teachable moments. So it's examples of the children uh, exhibiting one of these four values that we can pick up on in the cool down, which is the final phase. And um, in the cool down, we come back together and we have a great uh, professor working with us who's done lots of peace education in the past. And he tries to facilitate and lead a group discussion where these children can start to see how they can resolve conflict themselves. 
using so, the tools that we've installed for them. And this program came from an overseas uh, institution that has already worked with children in Israel and uh, Ireland and other mm. flashpoints of conflict. Uh, so that model was adapted to here to to, uh, to work here in Korea. Um, was there any special planning that 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 went into play? Mm, well, first of all, I'd like to explain how this program got off of the ground because it wasn't an easy thing to get started. Uh, when I was a master's student at Korea University, I was lucky enough to do an internship at the Korean Sharing Movement, which is a, a humanitarian assistance uh, NGO for delivering assistance to North Korea. And I met these people and I was really inspired by them and I wanted to uh, look into the future at other methods that we can resolve the conf conflict. And I told them about this program, which, as you say, originated in uh, Israel in 2001 with just a handful of children and is now over 1,500 people uh, in Israel alone. And I told them about this project and they were really enthusiastic they were looking to expand their work into peace education here in South Korea so that they can continue to have an impact on a situation which has become very flat. So we applied to uh, Seoul city government and they gave us funding and um, we finally managed to get the project going at the beginning of October. And um, with regards to the differences to that program in Israel, one of the main benef positives and benefits that you have here in Korea is that you already have local ownership. Uh, if I leave tomorrow, this program can continue because uh, by my assistant coach, all of the other people involved are Koreans and they're committed to this program. So whereas in Israel you had British and German academics going there and training the local coaches, here we already have it being run by Koreans. So I think that is a really good uh, point of our program. And just actually to be fair to the program in Israel, they have now handed over ownership to the locals and they're very much interested in that. But what we have here is we have that from the start, which is a real positive for the future of uh, peace education here in Korea. So how many children are involved in the initial round of the football program you're running? Yeah, so we have about uh, 12 children at the moment. And uh, so we organize into smaller groups uh, when we are playing the games. And then when we play the games, we uh, do various things to try and emphasize the cooperation and responsibility, etc. For example, uh, as the game goes on, we take away the referee. And then the first time there's a little bit of a uh, disagreement about something, the children just stop and they look to us and they're kind of waiting for us to intervene, but we kind of step back and say, well, we don't, just don't say anything and we let them resolve it. And I mean, the first time, yes, we had to intervene, but by the second time, the kids learned that we were, the behavior that we were expecting and the behavior that would help them receive praise, positive feedback, was to resolve it amicably. And then, and there was no cheating straight away. There wasn't a... What was the key to their making amicable resolutions? I think the fact that they knew that they, could they would receive positive feedback from myself and the other coaches, uh, it, children learn very quickly from experience and from viewing other people. So when one group, one, one pair does it correctly and gets positive feedback, then the other children see that and learn from that. So we did that with the uh, referee. And then we also take advantage very often of what we call floating players who uh, play on the sideline and they are, they, the players in the middle of the pitch have to use these players to, um, to score a goal. But, so they have to use these players, so they have to respect them and trust them as well. But also that, that uh, part of the game doesn't necessarily have as much of the ball as if you're in the middle. So it's, maybe it's not quite as fun. but. Uh, we ask the children to swap those roles themselves. There's no coach doing substitutions. We have the children doing that. And then again, they're learning about respect by giving each other equal playing time. And they're also uh, not just playing the best players all of the time because they have to swap out 
uh, consistently. So we're giving them the responsibility to make their own decision. This play out in sports from your own personal experience, you're passionate about football. Does that mean you were a football player before, you've coached a lot? I'm known as the Pyeongchang Pele. Actually, no, that's just a joke. But um, I've played football since I was five years old, every week, and never to a very high standard, but I really love playing football. And uh, I did my coaching qualifications when I was an undergraduate student in England and uh, I coached in America and England and now here in Korea. And while I will always love playing soccer, uh, coaching is also very uh, rewarding. For example, just from running this program, uh, a week ago, one of the children's parents came up to us and said like, oh, my son's not very good at school, but he really loves sports and he's always loved football. And after the first session, he was really shocked that football could be so meaningful and have such a positive impact. That, uh, and it wasn't just for fun and it wasn't just running around kicking a ball. He was really impressed that what we were doing could help him develop and he could learn new skills through that. So you have a role on the 2018 Pyeongchang Organizing Committee mm -hmm. uh, for the Winter Olympics. Can you tell us about your role there? Yeah, certainly. So I'm working in the sports department uh, over in Pyeongchang and we have a team of a great team of about 20 uh, young young people who are working hard to stage a great Olympic Games for Korea in 2018. Uh, me personally, I'm mostly working on communicating with the international sports federations for each of the events, and I also communicate with the International Olympic Committee and help with those uh, official communications. Through working with the Olympic Committee. I have the uh, opportunity to learn about how to organize a huge sporting event. So I already have experience in coaching soccer and I have experience in peace education through my studies, but I don't have much experience of organizing a huge event. So I think f through this, hopefully lots of great opportunities to, to progress programs like this will emerge in the future. So what do you hope will come out of your work with the Olympic Committee? I hope to l learn a little bit more about the um, Olympic spirit. Uh, the Olympics are actually very closely related to peace. Uh, in ancient Greece, when the uh, Olympics were held, there was an Olympic truce for up to three months around the games so that athletes could travel in, saf in safety to the host city of the Olympic games without fear of attack. So at that time, all wars between city-states were suspended and armies were forbidden from uh, attacking any, any other states. And that uh, symbolism, that Olympic spirit, ha was renewed in 1998 when the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, uh, called for this international uh, Olympic truce to be reinvigorated. And that was actually supported by a United Nations resolution. And in 2012, for the London Olympics, it was the first time that every single member of the UN, all 193 countries, actually signed up to that truce. So then I think because the Olympics is such a big uh, event, they have the power to influence events around other, other news around the world. And we have thing, things like a peace truce wall that will be held um, that will exist in Pyeongchang as it has in other Olympic cities where people go and sign and pledge their commitment to this using sport for peace. So what will these peace initiatives look like in 2018? Okay, well, as you know, the uh, situation on the peninsula is very difficult to predict. So I think it would be uh, naive to plan events four years into the future when we don't know what will be happening. But if you think back to the Sydney Olympics in 2000, when the North Korean Olympic team and the South Korean Olympic team entered into the opening ceremony under the unification flag together, I think you get a kind of idea of the things that could happen in Pyeongchang in 2018. So there is a big role that sports can play in diplomacy and peace, but what do you think are its limits? Do you think we could actually resolve these you know, regional territorial conflicts and uh, historical issues uh, through sports? It would be wrong to say that peace can solve and put an end to war, 
but what peace can do is it can create the opportunity for uh, peace to happen. Peace, as I mentioned earlier, peace doesn't happen overnight. It needs to be built up slowly. And if you uh, think about, there are certain examples, like before the 2006 World Cup in Germany, in Ivory Coast was racked by civil war. But actually, when the country qualified for the World Cup, there was a call from the Football Association president for all of the warring factions to lay down their arms and come together and celebrate this achievement, and they did. And then that opens the ground for peace talks. Uh, likewise, on the Korean Peninsula last year, even though the situation was really uh, tense at that time, there was a football match between the North Korean ladies team and the South Korean ladies team in Seoul. And even though uh, North Korea won 2-1, the next day the newspapers were saying, well, everybody's a winner because we came together here in Seoul and we had a great game. And there were examples in that game where a uh, South Korean player got injured and a North Korean player came and helped her and get through the injury. And then at the end of the match, we saw the two coaches shaking hands and being jovial. I think that what sport does is it creates that opportunity for dialogue. And it also can install in people these uh, ideas that can help them be moved towards peaceful initiatives. So you came and chose Korea out of all of the other countries you could have gone to. Uh, and from your background, from what I understand, you had a strong interest in Palestine. Uh, what brought you over here? Mm, you're right. I, did, I spent some time in Palestine uh, before I went to university, and I was incredibly interested in the Middle East, and I still am incredibly interested in the Middle East. It's an incredibly dynamic area with many things going on. Uh, but I also felt that my focus was a little bit too narrow and that I shouldn't just specialize in one area. And then when I came to Korea and I became interested in East Asia with the rise of China, the div you still have the division of China unresolved with Taiwan. And then of course you have the division of the Korean Peninsula. And the more and more that I researched and read about it, uh, the more interested in it I became. And I think here on the peninsula there, where you know, there's still never been a peace treaty signed. We just have the armistice agreement here. But at the same time, it feels that because the Korean people have lived together, I mean, this generation's grandparents lived together, it does feel very possible that uh, peace could be just around the next corner if things take a positive turn. So that intrigues you? It and does, yeah. that you could perhaps play a role in that? I mean, I personally, I think it's, down to Korean people to, uh, to solve these problems. But I'm more than happy, I'm very happy to be here and to be uh, working with people that are so committed and so passionate to peace, such as the people at the Korean Sharing Movement. That and the youth. Mm, and Why do you think the youth has ha really have to play a, um, a role in this? Well, I, I think uh, they are the politicians of tomorrow, the soldiers of tomorrow, so the, the media of tomorrow. So these are the people that are going to be making decisions. And ch when children are growing up, it's when they make up their mind about these issues. So whereas at the moment the situation might seem very bleak, although there could be some positive news w at the moment coming out, uh, I think it's up to the youth of tomorrow to resolve these problems. And at the end, of the day, I think uh, if Korean people living on the Korean Peninsula think about, do they want this situation hanging over their grandchildren's heads in 80 years time or whatever? I think most people would answer no. We want a resolution to this. We want to see uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula. And do you think the children who are participating in your youth program uh, think deeply about this already? Uh, it's a, a good question. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the four phases and we have the warm up and the cool down. And during the warm up, we have our uh, Professor Kim, who's done lots of uh, peace education in the past. And he's very good with young children at explaining concepts simply. And we're not, we're not pushing things into them. We're saying, what do you think about this? We showed them a picture of the North Korean woman helping the South Korean injured footballer. And 
We said, what do you think about this? And everybody thought it was great. They thought it was fantastic. And then the next week we showed them the pictures of the program in Israel and we said, well, where's this? And where's this wall? This wall's in Palestine, but it's a little bit like the DMZ, right? And then the kids, I think we should give them credit and they, they, are, they can make the links and they can understand the concepts that we're trying to get across to them. And from your perspective as uh, an academic in this area, what do you think is, are some of the vital next steps for of resolution in inner Korean uh, conflict? Mm. Well, that is a very difficult question. <laughs> but I think that relying on governments and waiting for a breakthrough with a treaty just leads to more disappointments. I mean, after the big summits between North and South Korea, there was a lot of hope but then nothing changed, so then you have a disappointment. So it breeds this cycle of pessimism where these issues seem unresolvable. So I think we need to, instead of relying on the high level meetings, we need to try and increase um, inter-Korean exchanges at the middle level to build up a desire for peace amongst the people and also to build relationships as a stepping stone to peace. So this could be between academics or sports groups like ourselves. I would dearly love to take this project to North Korea and play with mixed teams in the future. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Or it can also be through uh, NGOs. I mentioned the Korean sharing movement. Uh, that organization has been to North Korea and delivered humanitarian assistance more than a hundred times. So of course, during their um, travels, they've built up relationships with the people there. And these are human relationships. It's f far away from the uh, political parties in South Korea and the party in North Korea. It's people to people relationships. And I think that is the key foundation stone for any future uh, peace here on the Korean Peninsula. So what would you say is your largest goal for your time here in Korea? Okay, well, uh, my goal personally, if I could just influence uh, one of those children and ch make them think very deeply about this and think actually there are ways to resolve conflict that don't involve pushing or shouting or swearing or picking up a gun if you <laughs> were to go to that level. Uh, if I were to influence one of them to change their mind, then I would be very happy uh, with what I've achieved here in Korea. Um, on a slightly larger note, I think that our goal as an organization, as a, as a program, would be to grow and influence more and more children, and then those children will become the uh, leaders of tomorrow. Not necessarily the political leaders, but the um, leaders of the civil, civil society groups that could exchange and run exchanges with North Korea. Wow, well, it definitely seems like on a grassroots level and on a high level, you are contributing a lot to this movement and this direction for peace. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight. Okay, thank you very much. After 10 made its debut on November 2nd, 2012, and this Friday marks its one year anniversary. And thanks so much for sending in all of your comments. We definitely loved reading them and hearing what you thought. Well, that does it for us tonight on After 10. Join us again next time.